<clears throat> hey guys, welcome to Hope It Helps, and my guest on the show today is Mr. Hussein Wahbe. Hussein, welcome to the show, man. Um, welcome to the show, man. Ah, what? I'm not smart. Okay, guys, we'll put this in the blooper side. It's fine. Yeah, I was like, I was like, is he going to speak? All right, cool. Hey guys, welcome to Hope It Helps, and my guest on the show today is Mr. Hussein Wahbe. Hussein, welcome to the show, man. Thank you, Khaled. Very pleased to be with you on the show. Thank you so much for your time, man. I really appreciate it. So, Hussein, uh, we were talking just now, you know, off camera about, you know, how kind of we got connected and the work that you're doing. So, guys, Hussein uh, has a crazy story. He's been involved in probably everything. Um, you know, he's been in the corporate world for over 22 years. He's now uh, leads multiple uh, of his own companies. He's also the board of many companies. So he's got um, Plugmina, which is a uh, logistic advisory uh, services company. And then he, out of that, I'm guessing the sales Middle East got built because it's a platform that's helping yeah. people conduct like supply chain and logistics and so on. So it kind of like, it made sense how you, you know, opened that other one. Um, for today, Hussein, what I wanted to talk to you about is kind of your career, entrepreneurship as a whole, you know, um, you're someone who has very unique experiences. You have a lot of experience in the corporate world, but you've dabbled in and out with like entrepreneurship and now you're kind of in that as well. So I'd love to hear, you know, your experience in that transition. How did it feel? But before we get into everything, Hussein, why don't you give all of us a little bit of background about yourself and we'll take it from there. Yeah, thank you, Khaled. I think um, this will be an interesting podcast. Uh, I'm going to speak about things that many people already know, but it's always good to remind people of the greatness of having a mix always between corporate and entrepreneurship. Yeah. Um, I Yes, I worked in the corporate for around 22 years. Uh, great learnings, excellent knowledge. And uh, I think uh, everybody today, I tell everybody, the corporate is the right base to strengthen your bones. To strengthen your bones. Of course. I mean, every fresh graduate should come into the corporate, take experience and grow. The question is, corporate or entrepreneurship, we will discuss this during the episode. Uh, absolutely. But yes, I worked for 22 years mm -hmm. in uh, multinationals. I had the pleasure and uh, to, to lead big organizations. And it wasn't really a tough mission. I can tell you it was a very exciting mission. And then I decided uh, a couple of years back to try yeah, you know, yeah. to tickle <laughs> Why entrepreneurship <not? laughs> because I saw a lot of people uh, going that path. Sure, sure. It's good to try it without closing your doors on coming back to corporate. So I opened my company, Plugmina. Plugmina came as an idea because I saw that there's a lot of great consultancy firms and advisory firms, but clients need more execution. Execution. Yes, so, and practical execution. So I said, why don't I try to change this a little bit by introducing this concept in the region where Plugmina is a partner who plugs itself uh, with clients to help them in different areas. Focus of Plugmina is on logistics, supply chain, e-commerce, delivery, because this is where the future is today. Okay. Of course, it's not li limited to that. It can be more of restructuring and everything. Sure, sure. And Sales Middle East, just to correct you, oh, sorry, it was please, created yeah. two months back. I saw a very big gap in sales in the region. In sales? Very big gap. Okay. I'm a salesperson. I started as I a can tell, by the way. I can tell. <laughs> I mean, I can I sell can you tell. the moon, but of course, when I sell you the moon, I sell you the real moon. The, the, the good one. <laughs> the big one. And uh, I found that many companies today struggle in finding the right salespeople, hiring them. Yeah. And hiring is only maybe a fraction of the services. Mm. Training them, coaching them in the field, helping them to get business, opening your network to connect them to clients, lead generation, actual lead generation, going with those people to the visits and coaching them in the field to upskill them and uplift their skills is something that nobody is doing. Mm. So this is the mission of Sales Middle East today. It really can serve all industries. And sure. I believe there is a big gap and this is where I can start. I started to see a lot of demand on these services. It's very interesting that that's the gap that you um, that you saw in the market from a, from a sales perspective. But I get what you mean in the sense that a lot of sales training is very. I think sometimes it's not very real world based. It's too situational, and it doesn't take into account the nuances of like this kind of conversation or like the body language and this. And there's so many things that go into that. 
I wanted to uh, just uh, circle back to um, your, your mindset, the can-do mindset and the why-not mindset. Um, it seems that I listened to your TED Talk and it seems that those two things have been very, those two aspects have been very, very key to your success. Obviously, with uh, every entrepreneur, with every dream, with everything you're building, you always have a lot of optimism and positivity, kind of like what your mindset kind of is. And then life comes and gives you one nice slap to be like, oh, okay, uh, I need to maybe not, cha- I'm not changing anything, but I might need to recalibrate. So could you tell us about the moment that you realized or the situation that you realized you're like, okay, I do, I still do believe this mindset, but I need to, I need to change or recalibrate how, how I use it. Look, mindset is super important because it is the driver of all your actions, no matter what you do. So in my TED talk, and I created my TED talk based on raw experience. I was super excited when I was delivering that. And yes, it was everything that I've done in my life was due to my positive mindset. Okay, the can't do mindset. Whatever I cannot do is literally whatever cannot be done. Okay. Logically. Mm. So here, this is where common sense comes. Mm. I cannot fly. I will not think of flying. So I will not <laughs> overpromise myself. But uh, I think uh, the can-do mindset sometimes can be very exhausting. Exhausting? Because, yes, because you will keep trying because you know that this can be done, but it needs a lot of efforts. Mm. And the circumstan- c- circumstances around you will not allow you to reach what you are trying. I'll be honest with you. Please. I have partnered with companies as an advisor and reached brands And those brands, I'm not going to mention them because you will tell me you will charge me for an advertisement, (laughs) but I value them. These are my partners. I had dreams of being an advisor for them. Okay. 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 And I ended up with three of them advising them or working with them somehow. Sure. Because I said, I can do it. How much effort I have put in that, honestly, 50%. But the other 50% was luck. So maybe my mindset here brought me luck i don't know we're not going to talk about now being a gypsy person but uh, it happened so sure. this gave me more power to keep on working myself i'm a human like everybody you see me on linkedin every day very positive but i have my down times as well absolutely and during those down down times nothing pulls me up other than you know what hussein you can do it so it is important yeah it's exhausting you should not only depend on, the, on it 100% because it can take you into a lot of dreams mm. that may not be fulfilled. And the moment you don't fulfill it, you will go down again. Exactly. So balance between being realistic because sometimes, sorry, you can do it, but something is going to stop you from mm. doing it. So you quit and you do something else. Yeah. You, I, I think you said something super important there that, you know, realizing when is it time to pull the plug and move on. Uh, I think, you know, speaking for myself, even for like my podcast or whatever, they always say don't have um, an emotional attachment to like your business and stuff. Uh, And I've seen entrepreneurs and even myself, I'm like, when I think about someone coming into like this space, I'm like very protective, very, you know, whatever, which is probably not the, the healthiest or the right thing to do. But how did you, I guess the question then becomes, because you have on one side of your mind, you're like, I can do this, I can do this, I can do this. And then there's reality of what can and cannot be done. How did you, like, how do you know, and you said, you said a very key thing, circumstances in your, around you may not allow you the time or the ability to get to the stage that you're trying to get to, to move on. So what, adv- like, how as an entrepreneur, do I know or should I know what advice would you give me on knowing when, when is it time to unfortunately pull the plug on this? You should pull the plug when your financial situation is not improving because in the end it's business. Absolutely. Okay, entrepreneurship, okay, it gets sold as a beautiful thing. You own your own time. You're the CEO of yourself. You wake up whatever, whenever you want. This is good, but you work 24-7. I, mean, mm-hmm. I work 24-7, literally. Mm-hmm. Uh, not because I want to, because I have to. Putting the plug is okay. I mean, you can do entrepreneurship for a few years. This will strengthen your capabilities as a business person. Even if you left the corporate, you did two or three years entrepreneurship, your resilience was multiplied by 10. Mm, so the yeah. moment you see that your financial situation is not improving, don't shut down your business. I always say it. 
keep your businesses and go back to corporate. I mean, as I told you during our chat, people ask me, does this mean Hassan, I'm out of corporate? No, I'm not of, out of corporate. I'm still open for corporate. Mm. I'm still being approached. If the right opportunity comes to me as an executive who goes to a corporate because I'm misleading people, lead an organization while having my side business on the side being handled by somebody without a conflict of interest, why not? Sure. This is something very important people should say because I know entrepreneurs mm. who quit uh, corporate, they went into entrepreneurship, they failed, and it's okay to fail, we learn from our failures, and they are shy to go back to corporate. No, you are not a fail. Mm. You are just a person who tried to experiment something, mm. you gain more resilience from your failure, yeah. or from the slowness of your business, it doesn't mean that you are failing. Go back to corporate, have a stable income, uh, contribute to the corporate again, but keep your side business on the side on a very slow cooker, I say. Mm -mm. You can cook it slowly mm -mm. until you're fully ready. So like, you, it, yeah. by the way, you may not be fully ready. You may enjoy staying at the corporate while having somebody who manages your business as a passive income. So this is my advice today. 10 years back, we used to say, Khalas, leave and go. <laughs> yeah. no. The reasons of leaving, I'm, I'm sure you will discuss them. Yeah, exactly. Because um, uh, you mentioned it off camera and you, you just mentioned it now, how the difference between um, working in the corporate and working uh, and being an entrepreneur and how you mentioned like how a lot of entrepreneurs would be uh, feel bad to like have to go back to that world and so on. And when you're saying that, I can put my hand up and say like, I would be honestly probably be one of those guys. Uh, which that's why I'm terrified every day. I'm like, I don't want to go back to that. But um, you mentioned something about like that um, corporate will strengthen your bones. It will strengthen your foundation. You worked in the corporate world for 22 years, both in public and private sector. And I'm sure all of that experience, priceless experience, has been uh, instrumental in uh, helping you build and be successful in what you're doing right now. But obviously there's many, uh, just as there's many corporates there's many entrepreneurs that start from the beginning you see them those 18 19 year old guys the young ones that just start and build and they try and they fail they don't go to the they don't go to the corporate world and so on so if because i think my two cents i would love to hear what you think i think if you're gonna take the entrepreneurial path what you learn there compared to what you would learn if you just went into a corporate like in the corporate world into a job i think the two learnings are completely different like as an entrepreneur you will be exposed to so many things that you'll need to address just as a person in order to build yourself as a person and as a business i still insist that you should start in the corporate many many graduates they start directly in entrepreneurship mm -hmm. for one reason and let's be realistic they have money <laughs> okay so especially uh, if their parents are rich which is good I mean, their parents will inject money in a company set up and they tell them uh, it's a trial and error. Mm. All right. They can succeed, but the percentage of success is very low because those founders, they don't have the basics of business. Uh, today, one of the things I do is, let's say, for example, uh, I do training for uh, undergraduates and universities some, sometimes to get them ready for business. But irrespective of how much you train them, they will never be ready to lead a business. Mm. Their soft skills are not enough initially. They don't have the real base. Mm. And this is why it's okay to start. The, the beautiful thing in the Gulf countries, and you see it in family businesses, local family business, most of them, and I've, I've worked with many of them when I was in the government as well, they come from the top family businesses. They start from scratch. They start as consultants, analysts in the government. Mm -hmm. They don't aim high. And their parents who are maybe millionaires and the builders of the business insist to put them there yeah. so that they will learn. So you see them going into, let's say, government entities, working for two, three years, understanding the business world, and then they come back to the family business, not as a CEO, maybe on a director level, to, to start learning the family business and then grow. And mm. this is excellent. Mm. This is, I think, how it should be. You have university graduates who go to the big fours a yeah. lot in this region. Typically, yeah. They go and they start there. This is excellent because, again, they will build their base and later on they can start of thinking to go into uh, a solo situation, mm, mm -mm. which should be at least not before five or six years. Again, okay. the world changed. 
maybe before I could have told you a different advice. But today the world is becoming very tough. Jobs yeah. are not available like before. So it's good to start with a corporate and then start thinking of your own business. You know what? That's, um, I think that's fair. Given my, I, I, so I worked in corporates and in startups for a couple of years when I was living in Amsterdam. And so I got the corporate experience and I got the startup experience. Um, sometimes I think, you know, with everything I'm doing, I'm like, do I need, am I ready for this? Do I need more time? You know, you get these thoughts sometimes as you're figuring out, do I go left, do I go right? I don't know. Um, but I think when it comes to, um, when it comes to building yourself as a person, like you said, the corporate world strengthens your bones. It gives you structure on like, what is a business? What's important in a business? The numbers, you know, all, all these kind of things. Now, if you went back and looking at the last 22 years from when you started to, you know, where you are right now, you said the world has changed a lot and the demand for jobs is changing. So in your, from your perspective, I'd love to hear, what do you see the next like five, 10 years of this whole, like the job market kind of, you know, look like? Because like you said, it's changing every single day. To tell you, I'm worried. I don't want to scare you. But from whatever I'm, I've been seeing recently, there is a very big uh, supply of great talents, great talents, who are looking for jobs. And unfortunately, many companies are not seeing those talents. They are just treating them as another CV paper that comes to their email and they don't even look at it. Although I know them personally, and I know that these people are plug and play people with a guarantee of 20 years from my side. So if this continues like this, while having big organizations shrinking down and downsizing, because you see a lot of them today, the job market is going to be much tougher. Mm. But here, it doesn't mean that we raise the white flag, white flag. This is where if you are somebody who comes from corporate and you're jobless, instead of sitting doing nothing every day, <laughs> and many of, of maybe our colleagues who are watching this episode <laughs> will stamp that I have met them and sat with them and I told them, instead of just applying to jobs every day, Go now immediately, buy a website, choose a name, create a business, make the logo, and try it. Mm -hmm. It may work until you find another job. So it's good today for everyone, if your situation allows, to open your own business and try whatever your passion can be offloaded mm. to be monetized. Yeah, exactly. Because the future is for the small and the medium mm -hmm. i'm telling you mm -hmm. not for the big giants anymore big giants are shrinking the small and medium are growing yeah exactly and they are disrupting the big players big so time. if you are working with a big, big brand it doesn't mean you're gonna stay there forever it means that your days maybe are limited it can be a year it can be 10 years yeah but yeah. in the end you will have to be having a plan b yeah. always i say have a plan. B. Have a plan. <laughs> you know, because um, uh, I know, so COVID for you was kind of, I think for everyone was kind of that like, you know, the world like just pause. And we had to all sit and think like, well, what are we supposed to do? So I thought it was very interesting, <laughs> very interesting how you put a poll on your profile to, uh, to ask people, uh, should I go back to corporate or should I not? And 70% said, you know, go be an entrepreneur. So you, like, so you went and did it. My question to you is, because I've like read a lot of books and they talk about how um, you know using your art, using your network, whatever, get getting feedback, you know, like which post do you like this one or this one, you know, just testing things like that. My question then becomes: In your case, it works because you already had built, you know, Mashali had a good following and a good audience, so the reaction was uh, from the amount of people you can be like, okay, that's a good sample size, you know, to to go do this decision. But what if what advice do you have, I guess, to the people who don't have, you know, the kind of audience that you do? How would they figure out is this something that I should pursue? Is this something that I should not pursue? Do you understand what I mean? Because I yeah. feel it can be a bit challenging sometimes. First of all, let me tell you thank you because you've done a good research. I mean, reaching this poll, it means you've scrolled on my LinkedIn profile for hours. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Purposely I did that. I didn't want really somebody to decide on my behalf, but I wanted people's opinion because in the end, those people will be my clients. They will be the people who will support me. So I did a poll and I, because at that time I was having a lot of executive jobs, very good ones coming to me. And I didn't want to say no, but I was having again the tickle of entrepreneurship. So I said, mm. let me try it. <laughs> so I did the poll. Should I go back to corporate or should I open my own business? 
the the results came do your own business which gave me trust that people trust me okay and they want to work with me and the funny thing is i always say this i plan to take all the ones who voted for me to go and open my own business to take screenshots of their names and then approach them one by one and tell them yalla I have opened my own business. <laughs> Father, give me business. <laughs> I'm a sales guy. You know? the sales is sales. You know? I, I didn't yeah. do it till today, by the way. I didn't have time to do it. Mm-hmm. But I mean, <laughs> will I do this again now since I think, okay, why not? Going back to corporate is a great thing. No, but look, again, this poll is very, very, very uh, emotional for me because the moment people contributed in that, it means they care. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And in the end, the decision was mine. Sorry, mine. And I was influenced by people because this is where they see me. Exactly. All right. They see you as someone who's running his own business. Exactly. Gotcha. So, yes, it's good always. People who don't have audience, I will not go and tell you like everybody else, unrealistically, follow your gut feeling. (laughs) Yeah, Habibi, there's nothing in gut feeling. (laughs) Gut feeling is not there. I think you need to, you need to ask, some mentors and people yeah uh, you need to really get advice before taking a decision if you are financially capable to take the risk take it so let's say try it for a year it's okay yeah if not then at least during those days don't do it unless you are sure that you have the right funding Mm -hmm. the right backup yeah and the right business which is needed in the market. You just cannot copy any business and say, I want to be like this name. So that's really my advice if you don't have a LinkedIn audience to give you that advice. No, no, but that's very important because I think a lot of people don't start businesses or don't take that leap because of what exactly what you just said, you know, the fear or the financial resources and so on. I've been, I was talking to my dad um, and we were kind of talking about what you're saying, how the job market is changing and so on. And I read reports that in the future, the future of work is like hybrid. So like, for example, maybe a corporate job and a little thing on the side, you know, that, you know, you run yourself. So now it's very, it's very interesting. So now we're in probably the most competitive time to get a job and to make money. And it's also, ironically, the probably in the history of life, the easiest time and the, to make money and to grow your business because now you have access to chat GBT and AI and all these incredibly powerful tools. You can have businesses running with AI and you can go to sleep and they'll, you know, they'll take care of everything for you. So the, my, my philosophy is like now we've entered this new arena. The people that will win in this new world are the ones who can use AI the most effectively. That's my, that's my opinion because the tools are there for everyone to use. So it's going to come down to who can use it the best. That's my two cents. What do you, what do you think? I have a mixed opinion here. Okay. AI is a great tool. It's a great technology to facilitate and enable you not to make you a cheater. So today, and my clients know this very well, and I tell them, you can go and check. If I ever create content for anything I'm working with you, based on AI, which means AI have created that and I will only deliver it, don't work with me. Yeah. I would rather use AI to help me in structuring my my content for my business, be it a training, be it a course, be, be it a proposal uh, to save me time Mm-mm. rather than doing manually. Instead of an Excel sheet, I can go maybe to AI and do it in one click. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. It can help me to get insights and research Rather than, you know, going and Googling everything, AI can provide me this and then I can put, okay, it's okay. So we have to be very careful in using AI because it's a trust issue. In the end, if people want to work with me or you as an advisor, they want our experience and knowledge, not AI's knowledge, yeah. not ChatGPT. Yeah. Otherwise, they will pay for ChatGPT <laughs> as a consultancy fee. So I always advise people, yeah. use it wisely, but don't. many people... Maybe use it today on LinkedIn mm. to put a post. Yeah. You see it because the, the amount yeah. of content some people are posting I, is not normal. This is not thought leadership. I mean, you cannot say mm. I'm a thought leader. Mm-hmm. If AI generates content, you copy it and paste it on LinkedIn and get engagements. Because this is not you. You have mm. to be authentic. Mm. So AI is a great enabler for authentic people when it comes to social media. Mm-hmm. AI is a great time saver and a facilitator for you as a business person. Yeah. You mentioned, you said something very, <clears throat> very key there that um, AI is there to help you, but 
you don't you shouldn't become a cheater and sometimes it can be very tempting you know to like uh, go use it for certain things i think what we i think naturally as humans our problem is we are default lazy we want convenience we want the easiest way to do it so if this thing can do for me in one second there's a good chance i'm going to use it but looking at the statistics what's interesting um analyzing social media content is the one like a, a post that you let's say you made a post and i made exactly the same post about the same thing but i use ai and you didn't you get i think 30 40 percent higher engagement because people can you know people can tell when you're being authentic when you're not i want to take you back a little bit to um your because your your story was very inspiring to me in the sense that you you're you were a dreamer from a young age you always wanted you know to do your own thing and how you started with aramex and from day one you were you know packing just just packing boxes you know get to work you know starting from there and for you to have, I remember that uh, you described me at the time, the, the humility to be like, fuck it, okay, this is the job, this is what I got to do. And your dream was to become a manager. And then your dream was to become a CEO. So my question is, how did it feel when you, when you finally hit that CEO mark for the first time? Um, look, it's, it was a great feeling, but for me, it was never about the title of a CEO. It was the power of a CEO. Of course, yes, of course. So when I was, when I started with Aramex as a very junior person, again, yes, all of us started the old generation <laughs> in packing boxes <laughs> and uh, doing the coding for the Airbus and routing shipments and everything. But this is how you learn to start from scratch. Yeah. And yes, I was ambitious. And honestly, my hard work and the great leadership I had at that time helped me in growth in growing in, in the organization where I reached a manager level and then a director level and maybe a CEO level. It all came without me going and knocking the door and saying, I want to be promoted. And this is something I'm very happy and proud in my, in my career. I never went and said, oh, if you don't promote me, I will leave. No, it always came by default because uh, my leadership did, right? yeah. saw me. And you know what? The secret was not only the leadership, believe it or not. 80% of the reason I was able to climb the ladder in Aramex in specific was the people. The people themselves, they will elevate you on their shoulders because they believe in you. And they are the ones who indirectly put pressure on the management to say, we want this person as our leader mm. without saying anything. Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. just a vibe that happens. Yeah, yeah. And many times I remember <laughs> still uh, rumors. People create rumors. Oh, really? Let's say, for example, if, uh, if a CEO role was open in the company or a GM role or a country manager, people will start creating rumors. It's Hussein. And then I don't know about it. And they come and tell you. Sometimes those positive rumors are indirect ambitions of people. They want you to take that role. Mm. And it happens. And by the way, it happened a couple of times. No way, yes. really. So this is the beauty of working in organizations where the people who you work with below you mm. believe in you. And that's how they elevate you. And then it reaches the management level or the senior level where they say, no, this guy is due to be promoted because people want him or her to really lead them. Yeah. And I think you touched on such an important thing uh, there, Hussein, in the sense that talking about people. So I've been reading a book right now um, <clears throat> called uh, Good to Great by Jim Collins. It's, uh, guys, shout out. Please go read it. It's incredible. And they talk about, you know, hiring and hiring the right people. You know, they say, oh, your, your business is your people. The, the, the book says, based on research, it's not the people, it's the right people. Now, You've been in the corporate world for 20, for 22 years, and I'm sure you've gone through or done some hiring, you know, at some point. I want to understand from you, from your perspective, let's say I came, I'm sitting in an interview, I'm with you, Hussein, okay. How, what are the characteristics that would make me a good candidate, you know, to, uh, to join? What would you be looking for? What would make me the right person? Khaled, I'm, I'm very proud to say that I have hired maybe hundreds of people across my career. And 98% of them, somehow, never disappointed me. I always go into the very easy way of hiring people. I look first at the soft skills. When I see you, I analyze you quickly in the first two, three minutes to see your character and attitude, mm. because this is what really matters today. And your willingness to learn as well. If mm. you come to me as an expert and start just selling yourself, you will you will switch me off from the first two minutes. Okay. The willingness to learn. I don't want you to know, know everything. Your soft skills, you are a positive person. You can work in a team. You can perform just by 
a bit of learnings and trainings, you will be perfect. This is how I always hired people. I used to have sometimes debates with HRs when I try to cut down the hiring process and, and the corporate. So I had no need for five or six interviews and committees because many times people will reject a very great candidate because they think, I feel this person is not suitable for the job. So, and sometimes a lot of um, exams that we do are not required. I mean, English yeah. exam for somebody who is already <laughs> speaking English, for example, <laughs> doesn't work. Yeah. Psychometric is important, but let's make it simple. In the end, you are not taking a risk. I always say this when you hire an experienced person, it's not a risk okay. at all. It's an investment. Mm. You may need to pay more to train him or her. But in the end, there is no human who will come in and do nothing or mm. fail you. I mean, I've never seen people like that. Yeah. You're one out of 100. Yeah. So this is what I really look at. Proudly, even with my clients sometime, and I've hired recently for one of my clients around six or seven people. The client thanked me for those. Seven people are top performers. Mm. Why? Because I know those people, how they performed in the region, in the industry or wherever it is. And I say, you know what? You hire that person. I'm responsible for his or her performance. I know that they are plug and play and there's a zero risk here. Even if they are not from the industry, we will train them to perform. Yeah. And <clears throat> talking about, <clears throat> sorry, people and hiring people and working, you've worked in many different industries across, uh, you know, across your career. And one thing that, you know, you said something very interesting that is, it sounds counterintuitive to everything I've read. So that's what I wanted to ask you about it. You're like, you put yourself into div a lot of different things, but with focus. And I'm like, okay, my understanding of focus and from what I read is I should be eliminating everything, not looking to the left, not looking to the right, putting, you know, those horse blinders on and just like looking straight. So my question, <laughs> my question to you is, do you feel, uh, I, from your personality, I can see right off the bat why you do it. You are that kind of person that wants to, you know, build with people and be successful and stuff. So I get why you do it, but I'm curious, if you reflect now, do you feel that has, if you just stayed maybe in like one area instead of going into five, do you think you would you would have been further along or you're happy that the five that you did have given you a certain perspective that you probably couldn't get over here? Again, there is always different perspectives on this. Yeah. It's very important to focus and I'm a person who really focuses, but I focus on what really matters. If okay. what really matters is scattered across three or four areas, I will focus on the four. Okay. Um, if I am a corporate guy today, I will focus, of course, on my business and the company I'm representing. Uh, but even within the organization itself, I will have to focus on different things, be it the service levels, be it the commercials, be it the numbers, be it the positioning, the strategy, everything. When you are on your own and you have passion mm. and adding value to others, sometimes you will be more scattered. As we say, you are the jack of all trades. Yes. And I wrote about this recently. Uh, yes, I am a jack of all trades because I have different things that interest me. So I try different things for my with my clients or for my clients. So when I go to a customer today and or a big organization and I have a couple of cards in my pocket which I present my clients, sure, I try to sell different solutions, for example, mm -hmm. which is okay because you will find any one of the needs will be in my pocket somehow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So exactly, this is yeah. how I do it. It's not okay. a matter of. I'm working, let's say, in technology, in logistics, in startups. No, 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 no. I don't do that. And many, many industries I don't approach. And I get approached a lot by clients from overseas to come here, set up their business, saying we want you to represent us in the region. I don't understand your industry. Hmm. So I don't throw myself into another uh, bucket of yeah, exactly. maybe lack of focus direction. No, yeah. I focus again, as I told you, on whatever matters. Mm -hmm. And it's working. I mean, it's working. It never affects my focus on key things that I have to deliver. Mm. It keeps me more excited, in fact. Yeah. So it's very interesting that you said that you you focus, uh, you're not actively seeking out, you know, all these different things, but you're being approached. People have, companies have certain problems and that problem might be split across many different areas yes. that you're going to have to like dive into and get into. And I know you sit on the board of many companies, you know, as well. So being on the board is something that I would love to hear from you what that means because i think people or maybe it's just me i don't understand what the like i understand why the board is there it's like the the final check after the ceo if you know if needed but my question to you is actually a couple like how do you decide 
which companies to be on the board of. What does that look like in terms of like your role? What do you have to do? And how has that, I guess, affected, you know, your career and uh, what you're doing? Yeah, that's a good question, Khaled. I have redefined the word of sitting on the board myself by calling it standing on a board. On a board. Standing on a board. So I don't care about the board seat. I would rather stand up and contribute around the table of a board rather than sitting once in a year or twice in a year uh, just to speak. So I believe boards today need to be changed. The board structures need to be changed mm. to have active board members in a proper governance structure. Governance is number one when it comes to boards and companies. Mm. But I think people like us who come from different industries, we love to sit on boards, not because of the title, not because of you want to put it as a board member on your title. It's much more of you want to contribute to the organization. Yeah. Of course, it comes with its, with its benefits uh, uh, for you, which is natural. But again, me personally as a board member in a couple of organizations, be it advisory or uh, executive board, uh, non-executive board uh, member, is to contribute and help the CEO and the, and the team on the ground in achieving the mission of the company mm. so that this will escalate up to the board later and showing that, you know what, we are here as a board or board members, not only to question you, our role is to question you as a CEO, but also we are supporting you as well. Yeah, This gives the CEO 10 times more power Absolutely. and yeah. a motive to perform and deliver. And this really needs to be changed. I mean, I always tell, I never put myself any limit to sit on any board as long as the board allows me to be an active board member, mm -hmm. to contribute on the ground rather than just sitting and asking questions during a one time or two, two time per year session. Yeah, I think that's so that's very refreshing to hear. It's the first time I've heard about, you know, um, a board being more active. But listening to you explain, it makes so much sense. Like if I'm joining a board of a company, it's in my interest for this to go well, because this is going to also, you know, it, uh, it is also going to help me. So and being active on it and having the ability to influence and the power to make decisions and, you know, be on the ground is something very important to you. And it's something that I think it sounds like if you feel like you can't, you don't have the, the resource, not the resources, but like the freedom to make the choices that you think you need to make for the business, you wouldn't probably join that, that board. Would that yes. be fair to say? Exactly. 100%, 100%. Yeah. 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 And you, you said something and this is, so, so this is an interesting one. So, you said the moment you stop caring about people, or what, uh, the moment you stop caring about what other people think, you will be unstoppable. And I 100% agree. Now, let me give you this. So I, my background is in sales. So, uh, and I did, I sat for three years. All I did was sit and pick up the fucking phone and every day, three hours, hi, this is Khaled. Hi, this is Khaled. Well, get out of here, we'll fuck you. You become bulletproof. You know, anyone in sales, you build like a bulletproof, whatever. However, what I've noticed is I feel that element, that like bulletproofness is like a muscle. And when you're not actively working on it, that on stop that like that muscle starts to get weaker and weaker and it allows doubt to start coming in and it allows, you know, uh, you know, being self uh, self-conscious and so on. So what my, my question to you is, do you feel that to build that resilience and to keep that resilience is something you have to always actively be working on. Definitely. I spoke about this uh, a lot. And I still speak about it and I will always speak about it. If you are there to worry about what others think about you, you will never achieve anything. Because you will never be able to, achieve, to please everyone. They always say you're not selling ice cream, which is correct. You have to be working to add value. You will have haters, you will have supporters. At the moment you stop feeling people, as I always say, is your optimal or the royalty level that you reach in your life. Because when you don't fear anyone, no matter who he or she is, uh, you will have the courage to approach them mm. for business, for partnership, for anything. And uh, this is where your, your attitude and character will change and you will not live in the fear of rejection, although you have to always accept rejection. I mean, even myself with all my network and connections, I get rejected by a lot of businesses that you know saying we don't need now your services which is fine i take it very positively so yes you have to be bulletproof and accepting rejection because it's part of life yeah but don't take it personal uh, That's hey, what I was. you yes. said it 
perfectly and I think this is the biggest number one challenge for Don't everyone. Don't take it personally yeah. because yeah. always manage your own expectations <laughs> yeah, and sure. then you want to manage your own expectations. <laughs> uh, the, the way to really, I mean, when you are in business, the way to really re- reduce the possibilities of getting rejected and this is a sales tip I always use, increase your leads or approaches. So if you're sell- selling a product or a service or an offering, reach out to 50 Okay, you will have maybe 40, 80 who will reject, but two will click. Those two who will click will give you that fresh air to breathe. Wow, it's working. Mm. But if you send one email to one client or you approach and visit and meet one client and that client tells you no, without increasing your reach, it will take you down. Absolutely. It's, it's very normal, you know. You uh, were in sales and you know very much. I know very yes. well, yeah, absolutely. And, because, and especially um, I feel in entrepreneurship that what you're talking about, these little wins are like gold because 90% of the time, for example, even in my case, like 90% of the time I'm like working and trying to get clients and whatever. And then I get that client. So I got that 10%. I'm so happy for like a moment. And then it's like, all right, where's the next one? You know, it's an, it's a, it's an endless, it's an endless, endless process. But, uh, and it's okay always to chase the client in a professional manner without harassing them okay, by yeah. following up. I yeah. mean, I always tell my clients, if you're not interested, just tell me. We're not interested. I close the case, but don't go silent. Don't go cricket uh, mm. uh, sounds. So yeah, yeah. Just tell me I'm not interested uh, again. But look, there is a challenging part of it here where sometimes you get a lot of people also approaching you to sell you something, but whatever they're selling you is not relevant to your business. Mm. So you don't have the time to reply to them as well, and that's a different story. Sure. Which is the salesperson didn't do his or her job properly by just approaching everybody randomly, spamming them, and this doesn't work. Yeah. And you know what uh, What kills me, especially since I was in sales, like when I get all these LinkedIn in-mails and things about any yani stuff, if you, if I'm the target market and you're sending me an email, I'm your Rossi. Like, I'm, like, good, you did a good job, I'm your target market. But when you're sending me stuff about, oh, you want to like uh, ships and this, I'm like, and who, who, who am I? Do you see me? I'm a podcaster, bro. I'm sitting, I'm sitting right here. There's nothing, exactly. I have no relevance to you. Um, Coming back a little bit, I wanted to touch on your experience in the public sector because you said that really, really taught you a lot. Um, so first, I want to start with I want to start with this. You worked in private, you worked in uh, public, and you worked as an entrepreneur. What did you learn in public that you could have never ever learned in private? One thing in public and I've said this a lot, I never went to work. You never went to work? I went to a place where I felt I'm contributing to the community and a society, which is which embraced me from day one as an expat by adding value to, that, to, to the community through working with the government around government services and improving things in the government. So it made me forever a public servant. Okay. Today, even I exited okay. the government, my heart and soul and DNA are still in the government as a public servant. Mm. So anything I do today in the private sector, be it for clients or alone, I want to create impact yeah. in the community. Yeah. Uh, maybe I've tried this in the UAE and it was successful. This is what I'm trying to do today in Saudi Arabia and other countries. By going and trying to work with governments as well, to improve things on the ground through the private sector. And this is where I still remember my great boss in the government, His Excellency told me when I resigned. And this is what made me today tell you this. He told me, Hussein, we are not happy that we lost you. Although he gave me the blessing to yeah, go back sure. to corporate sure, sure. because he saw the value. He said, under one condition, you will not, you are not leaving us you are going to be our uh, ambassador in the private sector. Imagine this, wow. how big this sentence is. To keep me always dedicated to in everything I do, I want to see the organizations in the private sector doing some impact on the community mm. in the nation, which really gave us the chance to work here. Yeah, and it makes so much sense now listening to you and reflecting on our conversation why working in government has a special place in your heart because your whole personality is, is just, I want to make an impact in every single thing I do. And probably government, 
you're not gonna there's nowhere to make a bigger impact than changing something in the government changing a policy and obviously the big problem we all hear is the disconnect between the public and the private so having an ambassador like yourself who has very is very um, experienced in both worlds you're the perfect bridge you're the perfect you know the, you're the perfect bridge to bring those uh, to bring those two things I mean I, I I wish I somebody comes and creates a role called chief bridging officer uh, that, uh, Man, I, I will, will take it yeah <laughs> <laughs> I will leave everything at the chief bridging officer between government and private yes. and this is very much needed by the way that's a new business uh, uh, yeah that could be a new business you, you know that could be the connection between the two you know. <laughs> exactly <laughs> you never know um, leadership okay first I'm going to start with this. In your, from your perspective, in your definition, define a leader for me. A leader is a person who comes and gets the best out of you through inspiration and never through power. So this lead, a person who will lead you is a person who will drive you to perform in a very empathetic, in supportive way rather than putting his or her force on you that's how i've i've learned this mm. maybe sometimes the hard way because sometimes people will abuse so leadership is not an authority it is an inspiration this is how i can summarize oh i love that yes i love that because yes. i think that's the biggest problem that we have uh, as a society as a misconception with leadership we think you know once you're at the top uh, my job is to, you know, sit and everyone do the work, you know, like the rest of the work for me and so on. But it's from everything I've read, the studies, the books, whatever, it tells you like as a manager, your job or even the CEO of a company, your job is to be a servant to your people. Your job is to help them get what they need. So I love, love what you said. It's not about, um, it's not about authority. It's about actually helping people. And in your career, you worked in many organizations. You've managed uh, companies uh, ranging a lot, uh, ranging in size. I was thinking, I'm like, does the size of the company affect the, your leadership style, or does it mean you have to recalibrate it depending on you know the size or the, how you've entered into this project? In my opinion, no. No. If you give okay. me a company today with a million people, or with five people, if I want to really uh, apply my leadership skills I can do it and let me tell you how I'm not the only leader in the organization my role is to create a layer of leaders below me who cascade down the proper leadership style as mm. long as my leadership style is really endorsed and approved by everybody yeah so if people like my leadership style I cannot reach let's say the biggest operation I led was I had around 4,500 people in the region wow okay mashallah. I never had the chance to know all of them okay uh, I'm sure, yeah, I'm sure. but uh, but at least I I was trying to create a layer of leaders below me or a couple of layers who will cascade down my leadership vision and they have the right attitude and skills to do that because their success was my success and I never came and said I'm the one who created success. I created success through those people. Mm, exactly. And this is where magic happens. Yeah. And believe me, today as we speak, many of those leaders are senior leaders, be it in the same organizations or they left somewhere else. And what makes you feel proud is they always fly around you and come and tell you, Hussein, you helped us you yeah. know, to, to craft our leadership. Yeah. So yes, you can lead a million people company, but set a proper leadership layer sure and then when this happens you set the values i call them the shared values that should be adopted by everybody exactly and these shared values are very simple you know you can create five or six values no toxicity no 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 whatever it is you will have the best performing company ever yeah and in actually it's so funny you said that because in uh, in the book i was reading they they echo those things and they say the you should be super like super critical about your the people in your key positions like you said because those are the guys that you're going to lead and they're the ones that are going to lead the rest of the organization or the rest of the division or so on so putting in the right team to make that happen not only makes your life easier it makes everything run a lot smoother yeah. and, and one of the things i love in corporate i mean any corporate job i get or i will get the beautiful thing is building a team that's the most exciting part of it is to build a team so you say you know what i need five people 
the C level VP director and names start to come to your to your mind from people whom you worked with in the past yeah or people whom you know in the in the in the field or in the industry or in the community and are the right people the best part is when you take the whatsapp or the phone and call them and say hey let's say i joined this company and i want you to come and join my team are you available the yes here makes you jump, you know, <laughs> because building a team, is, I mean, maybe I'm strange enough to tell you that this is the best part of leading an organization. And the moment you do that and you set everything in place, trust me, the business will roll by itself. Yeah. That's yeah. how it works. Exactly. And it's, I can see your, your smile and your reaction to that clearly out of everything, like this little, I guess, element is the area that you love, you know, you really are passionate about and love doing the most. And I think that you look at it as like, this is a, okay, we have an organization. This is a jigsaw puzzle. To make this thing work perfectly, I need something of this, something of that. And you love putting that and bringing it all together into like one cohesive yes. team and unit and, you know, uh, building that on. You mentioned something about um, when I was uh, doing my research about that, the feeling you had. Um, when you transition to an entrepreneur and that first client, when you got paid as that first client, because it re that really resonated with me because I remember that feeling of when I got paid for, you know, the, for uh, the work that I do. And I'm like, even till today, I'm still like mind blown. I'm like, and it really hits home when I get paid because I'm like, this is, there's, there's nothing else here. There's no one, it's just, it's just me. Someone saw that value in me and that's something that's very precious. But as you know, as an entrepreneur, you get that deal. Whoa, Mabruk. Okay, great. On to the next because that, that's all you think about. You just, the next one and the next one and the next one, which is, I think sometimes, at least in my experience, has made it um, hard to enjoy the wins because I'm just always focusing on, you know, what's next. But uh, for example, in my arena or what would you, uh, lead generation is probably one of the most challenging things for most organizations. Like you said, it's not about if I sent out one thing, one email and I got one rejection, I'm going to feel terrible because I put 100% into this one thing and it didn't work. But when you reach out to like 50 and you get those two, those two might be all you need, you know, to start building your business. So, and I've spoken, I've been in sales and I've spoken to people on the podcast who've done sales about like, it's all a numbers game. But from your perspective is it because i don't think it's just a numbers game i think it's there's there's quantity but you need really do need to have quality of who you're going after so for lead, when it comes to lead generation what advice typically do you give to organizations on how they should be thinking about building out that engine you know that's going to keep them running first of all sales is not numbers sales is about relationships first mm. And that's why I always say build a quotation before a relationship. Okay, that's the best thing ever. To be able to sell a product, you have to sell yourself first as a trusted partner. And uh, lead generation for me, and I included this in sales uh, Middle East, mm. Not I'm not there to do the work on behalf of the clients. I'm there to open their eyes on clients and partners who want to work with them, but maybe their salespeople did not see those opportunities somehow. But to answer your question, yes, I danced and celebrated my first <laughs> payment and first invoice. I'm sure, yeah, absolutely. And it was somebody who believed in me, honestly, or a couple of, it was two two companies who believed in me and I will always be grateful for them forever because that was the spark. Yeah. Um, and then things started to roll out. Uh, believe it or not, Khaled, I mean, most of my contracts, I'm always happy of this, but the problem is I'm benchmarking on this, are usually signed within one week of submitting because the client is in a hurry to bring you on board, work with you, and they see your value rather than taking this to millions of approvals and everything. Um, and some of them will take ages and, you know, they never come back to you. But also, when you are a startup, what you will struggle in is in payment collection. Yeah. You will face oh, yeah. people who will delay your payment, people I never faced, I faced only with one client who didn't pay me, and I'm going to get my money. <laughs> I know how to get my money. <laughs> of course, through the legal legal part uh, and absolutely, proper part. Absolutely, absolutely. But yeah. I was pissed off because that person, I trusted him a lot, and then he just disappeared. But the others, either they delay your payment, but you trust them that, you know what, in the end there's justice and there's a judicial system here which protects you in this region. 
okay, they're late, it's fine, but they will pay you in the end, although cash flow is super important for us as small businesses. And the third part is uh, they pay you quickly. Hmm. And I worked and I still work with many companies who chase me, chase me to issue the invoice, to pay me. <laughs> Man, I love these people. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I swear I can work for them for a <laughs> million years with yeah. the least profit. Yeah. Because this is where they respect you as a partner. Yeah. All right. So yeah. when somebody chases me, Hussein, send us the invoice. Mm. We want to pay you. I'll put them on my head. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I, I, I hope everybody, you know, does this because this really, it's an emotional thing, by the way, Khaled. Yeah. It is an emotional thing. Absolutely. They tell you, you did a great job. It's time for us to pay you. The, inshallah, I hope to one day get to that, you know, get to that stage where people are chasing to pay me. Now it's kind of the other <laughs> way around. Um, but in your example, um, so I've spoken about this a couple of times on the podcast and I would love to hear your perspective on this. I, I've always wanted to start my own business. Always. Since I was a kid, uh, it's just in my mind something that I wanted to do. I fell into what I'm doing now kind of, you know, by accident. But, and I'm like, okay, I'm a, solo, I'm a solopreneur. And I thought naively that, oh, as a solopreneur, I don't have overhead. It's just my time that, oh, it will be so much easier to build this and, you know, to make it work. And last year, last year, I call it, yani, last year was the first year doing this. And the lessons I learned, Yahsin, about payments and cash flow and structure and projections, I got the biggest reality check in the world, the, in, in the best way. And, and I've spoken to people on the podcast about this. I think there's a huge misconception about the entrepreneurship. And you talked about this at the beginning is like nice, flashy, exciting. You do this, I can do this, whatever. Yeah, you can. But with it comes pressure, with it comes anxiety, with it comes where's that next deal coming from? You have bills, you have overheads. So if someone wants to be an entrepreneur, what is the first question you would ask them to determine whether, okay, you, can, you should go ahead with this or are you not ready for this? I'll put my, myself in the seat of an investor. Okay. And tell them, show me how you make money. Okay. It's simple. It's business. Mm. I mean, entrepreneurship is not just a magical dream. It's business. How you will make your money. If I don't get an answer, I say drop it. And by the way, many startups I sat with as a mentor and they thanked me for dropping their idea. I told them, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. I can bet that you will make no money from this and it will crash. 95 or 100% of them, I don't know. I cannot remember. Maybe a big chunk of them, they had that feeling and they wanted assurance from me that it's not going to work before pulling the plug yeah. and going into something else it doesn't mean to uh, throw their dream no go into a different industry go into a different thing that you can do better because what you are proposing today as a new business doesn't have a market in the region exactly yeah so this is the number one question will mm. it work or no mm. again if you are a millionaire have a lot of money want to spend try anything you want <laughs> yeah, <enjoy. laughs> do whatever you want but if you are really depending on this yeah. as your bread uh, and butter yeah uh, think of it how you make money. Yeah, yeah. And I think, you know, again, I, I love what you said that we always try to overcomplicate things, but at the end of the day, it's business. Did you make more money than you lost? All right, you're doing, you're doing great. And it, it just comes down to that. It's so simple. And I really love that, how you like uh, just brought it like that. I have just two more questions for you, uh, a couple more questions for you, Hussein. So your dream once upon a time was to be a manager. And then the dream was to be CEO. You've done both. You've worked across multiple industries, 22 years, and mashallah, an incredibly successful career, and now you're on this beautiful brand new path. So what's the dream now? The dream is to keep dreaming of what I was dreaming before about. Uh, although I know that the problem in me is I have endless dreams. <laughs> I can tell for so, sure. <laughs> uh, so I will leave this world with a lot of dreams pending. <laughs> but no, really, I would like to be on a path whereby, again, I always mix between uh, successful business and creating impact, be it based, uh, on people or on businesses. Mm. This is really my dream. Mm. And to be positioning myself as the right guy who can come into any business, 
do what's needed. And of course, in addition to this, to leave impact uh, on the ground, in the society, so that you have a combination of wins here. Yeah, it's not yeah, only yeah. a personal win, it's a personal win, and of course, a generic win for everybody. Yeah. And um, it's very clear, I think, in our entire conversation, saying that it just keeps coming back to two things for you, which is what you just said, you know, uh, like people and impact. That's that's what you're trying to do. You want to raise people up and you want to help them and make an impact in whatever they're doing, because that's what you're that's the result of your impact on them. So it's like uh, this whole self-serving cycle, which is a beautiful thing. And. I, I realize in my life there's no greater feeling than helping someone. That's why this is called Hope of Hells. <laughs> uh, Hussein, for my last two questions, um, these are questions I ask all my guests. So first of all, uh, looking back at your life or career, either personally or professionally, when I ask you the question, what are you most proud of for yourself? What would you say? That I was able to believe in myself and, uh, and embraced the can-do mindset which allowed me to hit a couple of milestones I had in mind. And that can-do mindset that you've, uh, that you, you know, that you talk about, was that instilled through your parents? Is that where that can-do mindset came from? How did you, how did this mindset get formed? Was it a couple of experiences growing up? Was it your family, your parents? I'm just curious where, because when I was listening to your TED Talk, I'm like, it's almost like, uh, Hussein was born, like literally the second he was born, can do mindset was like default already, you know, ready, you plugged in. It's just give him some time and he'll get there. My answer is a bit spiritual. Please. Of course, like parents, friends, and everybody in yeah, family. Of course. The acceptance of people. The acceptance of people. Which we call in Arabic, qubul uh, al-nas, or mahabbat al-nas. Everything I wanted to do, I felt that people were with me on that they supported me on that uh, it's not being liked by people it's being accepted by people so in every milestone every step in my career and in my life the more i see people around me coming positively uh, uh, embracing what i do supporting what i do this gave me more power this mm -hmm. gave me because anything you need to do is related to the people around you be it yeah. an approval be it a rejection be it a promotion be it a hiring it is a human being who will take that decision. So the more you see people accepting you, the more you will have that can-do mindset getting more uh, uh, sparked in your brain yeah. to keep you moving forward. Yeah. If you are, a, and this depends again and goes back always to your attitude and character and how you behave and how you treat people. Because if you are really that person who people don't want to interact with, that toxic person, that negative person, you will lose it all. Um, you will not have the acceptance 100%. of people. People will avoid you. And this is where you will fail. Oh, by the way, you may not fail. You may end up being a millionaire to work in a specific organization that likes such people. But you know where's the trick? When you retire or you resign or you get fired and you lose all this, nobody is going to look at you mm. when you are at the other part. Exactly, exactly. And... Um, someone said this to me. I, I I really love that because someone said this to me recently on a uh, on my on the podcast. They're like, Khaled, the world is a lot smaller than you think. Exactly. So so be nice to people, and that that's kind of echoing, you know, what you're talking about. Because like you said, at the end of the day, whether to go, whether to improve, or whether to be fired or rejected or accepted, it's going to come down to a human being. So put yourself in a position that you can be accepted by people, like what you said because that will give you the best chance, not only for success in, uh, from a career perspective, but also in your relationships from a personal perspective, building you know, those relationships with people. Um, Hussein, for my last question, what is the message you'd like everyone to take home with them today? The message is take away from this podcast everything we said, because whatever we discussed today is literally practical it happened and it's part of any person's journey but the difference is some people speak about it and some people not my purpose of being with you today in this podcast is to try to support anybody who wants really to keep moving forward in a positive mindset with all the energy and passion and the examples that i gave you about me 
maybe they are limited to me, but trust me, whatever you heard from me today applies for millions of people. Absolutely. But those people don't have a great platform like you to echo that, to motivate others, and to really give the positive hope for everybody that, yes, the world is super small, but also it has a lot of opportunities around you. You just need to find them. Oh, man. <laughs> what a, that's such a beautiful way to end the show. Um, and like you said, there's, you know, opportunities there you just have to kind of you know go out and grab it and sometimes you might need a little bit of luck but that's okay um Hussein man this has been uh, and I love what you said that everything we discussed today you know I love about it is that it's timeless everything we discussed about being a person being a leader growing a business whatever this what we're talking about now is going to be relevant today was relevant 50 years ago and will be relevant in another 50 years Hussein I want to thank you so much, first of all, for coming on the show today, man. I really, really appreciate it. As I told you, I've been following your content for, for a while. Uh, so when I saw the chance, you know, to like reach out and have you on the show, I was like, there's um, no way I'm not taking it because he's been so helpful to me. So I'd love to sit down and help get more, more value out of him to deliver to a lot, you know, to a new audience and to more people because I think everything you're talking about can help so many people. Um, and I really appreciate the content that you put out, that you're trying to be positive and trying to make an impact in the world. Um, so there's not much more I can you know, say about that, man, just besides, you know, thank you. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you, Khaled. And I promise you one promise. You will not receive an invoice, advisory <laughs> invoice for this one. <laughs> Habibi. Uh, Hussein, if people want to reach out with you, work with you, connect with you, what's the best way to get in touch? I'm there on LinkedIn. Uh, LinkedIn? Uh, I yeah. have a challenge in catching up with all the messages. But I always tell people, whenever you want to send messages on LinkedIn, make sure that, you know, it's it's a win-win value for you and the others so that at least it can be captured. But I'm always there on LinkedIn and uh, people uh, can reach me out. You guys heard it here, guys. If you want to connect with Hussein, uh, m- make sure to reach out to him on LinkedIn. Super active. Don't worry, you'll find him. If not, he'll pop up on your page. <laughs> Hussein, I want to say thank you so much again for coming on the show, man. Uh, guys, to everyone listening, Please make sure to like, share, follow, and subscribe to the podcast at Hope It Helps Pod and on all other channels. And as always, guys, hope it helps. Peace.